I've got a question on, on prayer, right? right? So if we think, if, if, if the belief is that we, that we understand that God can't tell the future, that, that's your belief, isn't it? God can't tell the future. <laughs> well, that's a personal belief of mine, by the way. I'm not okay. saying that it's justified, but even the Rambam in uh, that portion in the Talmud where it says in Perkavot that everything is under heaven but the fear of heaven, he says that it shows that God doesn't know what you're going to do before you do it. In terms of God being omniscient means that he controls nature and he knows if it's going to rain or if an earthquake is going to happen, but he doesn't know if someone's going to do teshuvah. Well, he doesn't well, know. That comes to my question. That comes to my question. Then if we know that if he can't change those sort of things, why do we pray on behalf of someone if they have, I don't know, a serious illness? That's a great question. I feel the same way. The traditional because, response because I only is, say that because, mm -hmm. because obviously God responds to prayer because we see in the Torah that Mo Moses praying um, to God and God turns around and says, stop praying, just cross, cross uh, the Yom Suf, you know, get, get across there, you know. So he obviously listens, but does he act upon it? I, I don't know. I don't know. So I don't think the argument is if God listens to prayer, but if God knows what you're going to do before you're going to do it. Yeah. That's, or does God, yeah. that's problematic. That's something that I struggle with. Can God do the illogical? I mean, can God make a square circle? <laughs> I understand that we're all students of the Rambam in Jewish life, whether we acknowledge it or not. The Rambam laid down Jewish philosophy. And the Rambam was really a child of Islam just because he was surrounded by these unhealthy monotheists that theorized everything of God that influenced the Rambam's philosophy of what God is or what God isn't or what he can't do and what you can't say about God. But the Torah doesn't really put him in such a box. The tradition understanding on why someone should pray for someone who's sick. Now, this is how I learned that. I'm not saying I really accept this idea, but that if there's a judgment against a person with your prayer, you can ask God for mercy in this person's behalf, assuming that he's getting punished for something he did. But we know that everything that happens back to you in your life is not because you did something wrong. Okay? So then does that mean that, mean that God does know the future then? Why? Because then he'll be able to change the course of nature. But the understanding is that he made you sick in the first place. Not that he found the cure for coronavirus. <laughs> yes, but hang, on, hang on. If he made you sick in the first place, obviously he knows the outcome of your sickness, because he wouldn't make you sick in the first place for uh, for for the reason of punishment. So, I could point a gun at you, pull the trigger, and prophesy that in two seconds you're going to be dead. That doesn't mean that I'm a prophet. I'm not saying that I accept this notion that God makes people sick, although it happens. But I don't think it happens every time. I don't think every time with someone is sick that God makes you sick. I believe that chance does exist. And this is something that people have a problem accepting, that chance actually works in the theological system. And, and, that, and this, is where I, this is where I get confused, because if chance exists, then prayer doesn't, for me, then prayer doesn't work. You can't, yeah, that, that's just the way my brain is. Well, then you would also know that the Torah doesn't command you to pray. Well, that's right. Okay, so this is a later notion. The notion of praying for the sick it's fully a rabbinic concept, actually. I'm not against the notion. I think communicating with God is a great thing before the court developed prayer, because it's really just a midrash that teaches that it was Avraham who created Shachras and Yitzhak that created Mincha and Yaakov that created Mariv. This is not true. Okay. Prayer, as we have it today, for sure, was created by the court to resemble the orders of the sacrifices of the temple, with the exception of Mariv. Because there were no sacrifices at nighttime, which is why Marv is an optional prayer. If you're not able to pray it, don't beat yourself up. But many people, I would say the vast majority of people throughout Jewish history didn't pray Marv till recently. And this is why I was, was talking about Moses before, because when Moses cries out to God, says when they're standing at the, at the, um, the Yom Suf and they're about to cross, God turns to Moses and says, stop praying, just do your action. And it, from that there, it seems to me that, you know, God is, is far more interested in, in how you behave and what you do rather than standing around and, and saying prayers to the sky. Oh, for sure. That, that's, yeah. I had a discussion with a guy like two months ago. This guy was a missionary in Myanmar. And then he was telling me, Rabbi, would you disagree with me if I believe that uh, prayer is the highest form of worship? Now, I know where he's coming from. 
But I don't think that idea has a leg to stand on in Judaism. Prayer, I mean, prayer is a nice thing. Communicating with God is a nice thing. What Jews do nowadays, honestly, is not really prayer. Okay, let's be honest. It's reciting. Reciting and prayer is not necessarily the same thing. Even the Shema is not considered a prayer. Prayer, according to Allah, is really just the Amidah. Uh, but the way it's done nowadays, both in the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic world, it being done in a petitionary manner, I don't think it's endorsed in Torah. We don't see David necessarily asking. The book of Tehillim is full of shouts of praise to God and gratitude. And I think you're only supposed to ask things from God once you've exhausted every natural means for you to kill that Rodef, try to find a job. And then when your back is up against the wall, then you sort of like shrug your shoulders to God and say, hey, God, you know, bail me out. Okay. You know, but this notion that the first thing you should do is pray, I think is nonsensical. I don't think it appears in the Torah like this. No, 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 no. Moses prayed for uh, his sister Miriam. She criticized Moses for marrying a black. Okay. And and I know that that was conditional, that she did Lashon, Lashon Hora. She had an evil tongue against Moses. I mean, the rabbis debate and, on what her punishment actually was, because the Torah doesn't exactly say that it was because of that. But yeah, go ahead. Well, doesn't the Torah connect Lashon Hora with leprosy? Not necessarily. This is the commentary. The commentary says it. I don't even think the Torah even uses the word or the phrase Lashonara ever. The phrase the Torah uses is Rechilut. And if you look at where the law, it's hard for an Orthodox Jew to understand this because there's so much written about Lashonara in the Jewish world. It, it comes out of Psalms, guard your tongue. Right, right. David no, says, the word, guard your tongue, doesn't mean Lashonara. That's Shmir Salashon. Right. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. So the Chafetz Haim also comes from the Psalms, that he who wants to guard his life. The mitzvah, everything we do has to be tied to a mitzvah in the Torah for us to feel compelled to do it. And the mitzvah that tells us not to speak Lashon Ara is the mitzvah or the Yesud of being a Rechel, Rechilut. So Rechilut is being a tail bearer. What's, what's that mean? It says, don't be a tail bearer amongst your people. And that's it. And then... The rabbis ran with that and basically went through every rabbinical book and extracted every point of advice, compounded in many books, and people walk around not even being able to say something positive about someone because the Huffet Times says, oh, if you say something positive about someone, someone who dislikes that person is going to be forced to say something negative about that person, you know, so it's better not to say anything at all. And then you have kids not turning in child molesting rabbis because it's Lashonara, because at that moment that rabbi said he was sorry, and that's Teshuvah. I'm happy if it just would have remained in the realm of common sense, instead of now it's the worst thing you could do. And I understand that Lashonara is a bad thing, but most people who tell you don't say that because it's Lashonara don't have the first inkling of what Lashonara really is. First of all, there's a distinction between Motzei Shemra and Lashonara. Once it's been recycled through the rabbinical world, Lashonara means when you're saying something that's true. Motzei Shemra is when you're saying something that's not true. It, this is all you know, semantics. Don't be a gossip. And even within the laws of Lashonara, there's ways to break through all that because there's something called letoelet. So letoelet is when you're doing something for a constructive purpose. You're allowed to speak what someone else would consider to be Lashonara if you're doing it for a constructive purpose. Don't buy a car from this Israeli because, you know, I don't know, he's going to rip you off. Oh, well, that's Lashonara. You're saying Israelis are crooks. No, I'm looking out for my buddy over here. Also, it's Le Toilet. Rama also says that if three people are aware of what you're about to say, that more than three people already know it in the world, then it doesn't constitute Lashonara. No one mentions this, right? But these are the halachot. I'm telling you, because the average person who attacks you for speaking Lashonara doesn't know the actual laws regarding Lashonara. So in the Rambam, it's in Hilchas Deos. It's probably around, I think, a chapter and a half, probably less than 250 words. Now, the Chavetz Haim ran with that, and he wrote two books. Then I won't ever see. He wrote Shmir Salashon, and then he wrote Chavetz Haim because he was named after the book. Most rabbis are named after the books they write. But it's just so much. Well, like, between... that book, before I even converted, changed my speech. I, I will never put that book down. But right. I didn't know um, that there were a lot of halakha in, uh, in the Talmud. And I don't know if my wording is correct. No, but, there's no halakha in the Talmud regarding Lashonara. Okay, there's, there's uh, advice. 
It's okay. not halakha. Well, the court's not going to adjudicate you for oh. know, saying something nice about someone. It's midat hasidut. People get stuck on it between lashonara and spilling seed. It's like we've lost already 80% of the audience. You know. <laughs> There's bigger things to deal with, and all these rabbis on YouTube, all they want to talk about is wigs, spilling seed, and Lashonara. I mean, come on, man. It makes us look bad in front of the Christians. The Christians are out there running AA meetings, 12-step programs, you know, actually trying to do good in the world, and we're worrying about freaking burning wigs and, and spilling seed and Lashonara. Now, Lashonara, is, it's a severe thing. Lying in general, it's the source, in my opinion, of all evil. And back to the guest caller's question about prayer. Uh, Moses did pray for Miriam, and the leprosy left. Okay. So? So when the guest says that when we crossed the Red Sea and Moses was going to pray, but God did say, hey, they'll just, just start moving forward. You don't need to pray for me. And in other words, there is an incidence where prayer wasn't necessary, but I wouldn't yeah, rule out that, 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 that means... That's a good point. That's a good point. So, so then does then God know the future? So we established earlier that if the person brings it on himself and God made the person sick, and for example, God does punish the Jewish people for doing the wrong things. And he brings boils on them and he, heck, even punish the Egyptians because of the collective responsibility of Paro. So God does punish people. So if God did something, then yes, you can ask God to undo it. But to assume that every time you're sick, God did it, and that by your prayer that you could release someone from it, I think is a little unethical. Well, there was also that scripture where there was a, uh, uh, oh, was it Hezekiah or someone, and they went to the prophet. He says, uh, Ratzon, if it be your will. And yeah. we don't know what the will of God is. If so it's we in the prophets, it anyway. I don't even discuss it. But let's <laughs> stick to the Torah regarding God's will. Only because the prophet may have said something or done something that appears in a book called the prophets, I don't think it changes anything regarding theology in our lives today, nor should it. But then where did that prophet get that concept then to, to pray God's will? We don't, we don't, we don't know, know God's will. Okay. We don't know God's will. I can, we don't know we who wrote those books. That. We don't know who wrote those books. We're not required to accept books of the prophets. We're required to listen to prophets in our time. The job of the prophet is to speak to Israel in their lifetime, in their generation. For some reason, most people who study the books of the prophets nowadays do not ever connect them to the generation that lived at the time of the prophets. If you're telling me that this prophet is speaking all this stuff that is only applicable 3,000 years down the road, then what's the job of the prophet? Then the job of that yeah, prophet. Yeah, but if the prophet, if the prophet gets his. Uh, wisdom from the Torah, then it should be good forever. Not if he's introducing a new concept that doesn't appear in the Torah. Only because something well, appears should, in the books of the prophets. Then he would prophet. keep his mouth shut and he wouldn't say anything. <laughs> we have a commandment to listen to prophets when they arise, when we begin to sin, not to write books of the prophets down and every generation reinterpret it to apply to that generation. There is no commandment to accept that. There's many books that weren't even included in the canon, Ben Sira, even with the book of the Maccabees. Right, give, me a, give me a moment to think, because uh, if, if you stay on topic, I'm not as fast as you. I'm starting to get the light bulb on top of my head that I'm, I'm repeating so that I can learn it for myself, that we have, there were prophets that were given for a particular time and we're not commanded to listen to them we're only commanded to listen to them when they so there could be modern day prophets sure and can you give an example of who that could or might be tovia singer <laughs> but like i don't know <laughs> michael brown oh, i i i don't i don't i don't know who michael brown is michael brown i thought was a christian he is a christian oh okay anyone could oh, be a you're prophet being Heck, you're being yes. facetious oh you're being facetious you want me to give you an example of a living day prophet? I don't know. Now, who decided ultimately to canonize the books of the prophets that appear in Tanakh nowadays? So when the Talmud says that there were thousands of prophets, only because we have Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Jeremiah doesn't mean that these were the only prophets that Israel had. These are the ones that the rabbis of that time, flesh and blood, decided to write down. But there were many prophets. And I believe, and this is well, really the Well, who started the Hoff? Who started the reading of the Haftorah then? The reading of the, the reading of the prophets. So the custom began in the time of the Maccabees. Oh. But 
I don't think it was put into law till much, much later. There is some credence to the prophets. Of course, not as much as the no. five books of Moses. Not from a Torah perspective. There's a rabbinic command that on Shabbat, one should read a passage from the prophet. The whole order of the Haftorot are not set in stone. They're set in stone nowadays. Like you buy our arts for homage, people think like this order appears in the Talmud. Nonsense. Every community is allowed, even to read from the Torah, the idea of splitting it into parshiot is a much, much later notion. The command is just to read a portion in the Torah. There are limitations on how many pesukim, if it has to end on a certain note and this and that, but it's not set in stone in terms of what book you're reading. I'll be halacha next week. Like you guys could read from Sefer Bereshit. And I feel like you're breaking a halakha. Oh, Following, see. even though the notion of being tivrosh minatibor, don't do your own thing, is a halakha. That if everyone, if you go to someone's synagogue and they're reading the Parsha Mitzora, that you should also read that with them. You know, that doesn't mean that on your own that you can't fulfill the halakha differently. All right, here's another way to look at it. They they guessed about the idea of prayer. David prayed a lot and. He must have gotten his concept from somewhere. He must have uh, gotten from it everywhere. from Torah. Yeah, but you can't do that. You can't say only because this new concept appears elsewhere that that person must have got it from the Torah. This is what Christians do all the time. What are you talking about? Well, Yeshua is not creating a that, new concept. I, I know like, that's circular reiterating. reason. Okay. I know he's, that's he's, circular reasoning. However, we revere the Book of Psalms. What if, do you mean revere? David... Uh, it's not on the level of like I mean, divine it's a special inspiration. Book. Yeah, it's a, it's special a special book. book. Okay, but I don't think that the book of Psalms could add to our theology either. Now, it's funny. All these portions of the prophets, I also believe in them. But I believe in them under the auspices of everything being conditional. But if you fail to acknowledge that point, then that's when you start creating a new religion. If everything the prophets said about the tribes coming back, this nation gobbling up that nation, if all that was conditional, then what have I said wrong tonight? However, if all that must happen, it's funny that we only expect positive prophecies to still occur, but not negative ones. Isn't that convenient? Oh, no. Well, this must have, Oh, well, the 10 tribes must happen because of this. Well, I guess Nineveh must still be destroyed because God said that he was going to destroy it. Right. As a matter of fact, God never told Jonah to tell them that if you repent, I'm not going to destroy it. But they knew that every prophecy is conditional and that God wouldn't act if they acted first. No, but every every statement of the prophets has to come to pass. That's that's a Christian notion taken off of Gnostic Judaism. I don't think that's the message. No, of the I don't even I don't even think that's a Christian no notion because Christians believe that if there is a repentance, it will change the hand of God, so to speak. I don't think so. Christians believe that JC is coming whether you repent or not. It's just ticking down. That Armageddon is going to happen whether you're righteous or not. Now, Jews believe that if you're righteous, you can usher in the Messianic age, you can usher in the coming of the Messiah, all of the above. But yes, I mean, I call it a Christian notion, but it was taken from mystical Jews. If you believe that Prophecy is conditional. I mean, why wouldn't it be if God is just that if he tells you that he's going to destroy you and your family, but you happen to repent that God will change his mind, then what are we really discussing? No, but if you're denying the fact that prophecy is conditional, that this is why you're saying that all this must come to pass, right? No, those prophecies either happened or expired. And these statements were never meant to be used I was an almanac of things to come 2,000, 3,000 years on the road. Nonsense. The Torah is the only thing that one's required to believe. And the job of the prophet, which even according to the Rambam, there's prophets nowadays, is only there to bring you back to the Torah. Heck, you know what? The rabbis should just get together today and canonize more prophets. Why not? Take the words of, of Ellen White and put them in a book. And I'll tell you, 500 years from now, that generation will be quoting her just as reverently as you quoting Isaiah, thinking the end of the world is going to happen. Why not? This is the problem I have with the oral Torah. The oral Torah is rabbinic. It doesn't claim to speak for God. As a matter of fact, even the Talmud speaks about the errors in halakha. There's a whole masechet. It's called masechet Torayot. In the Rambam... Right, masechet means what? That means the... Uh, tractate. One of the books in the Talmud. Right. All right. And also, Hilchot Shigagot, here, which is in... 
in Mishnah Torah that talks about the errors in the oral law, the errors of halakha developed by the court, that the court itself, the Sanhedrin, Sadiqam, people today say what well, the Sadiqam can't sin. These people make mistakes and the Talmud says it. And there's even a korban. There's a sacrifice they have to bring when they give an erroneous ruling. Now, how could you Where's claim that in my second that Torah, the, didn't is that, is, so how can you think that we elevate the oral law to the level of Torah when we acknowledge that there's errors in halakha? In I, you have a point there. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I mean, but don't take my word I, for it. Trust but verify. No, 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 no. 